And now your question is, what happens with climate change? And with climate change, clouds contribute actually to making it warmer because both cloud types don't behave in our favor. Welcome to the Challenging Climate Podcast, where we discuss the big ideas and controversies in climate change with leading experts. I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy specialist. And I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. The climate is changing. Join us as we try to keep up. In this episode, we record our first fully in-person interview at the Gordon Conference in Climate Engineering in Italy. We speak with Ulrika Lohmann. She's a professor of experimental atmospheric physics in the Institute for Atmospheric and Climate Science at ETH Zurich. She is also the principal investigator of the Cloud Lab Project, a multi-year undertaking to investigate aerosol cloud interactions in wintertime stratus clouds over the Alps. And the project has recently included an outdoor perturbative field experiment that certainly has implications for solar radiation modification. That's part of what we'll be talking about today, mixed phase cloud thinning. Ulrika, welcome to Challenging Climate. Thank you. So much of your work focuses on aerosol cloud interactions. Both of those things are quite mysterious to many people, and they're some of the biggest uncertainties in climate change. So I thought it'd be great to start by going to the basics of, of both of them. And so when people hear the word aerosol, they often think of spray deodorant. But, but what are aerosols to scientists like yourself? I mean, the spray is definitely an example of it. So the way we define it is either a solid particle or a liquid particle in a carrier gas, in our case, the atmosphere. So it is either solid particles like mineral dust, or it can be liquid particles like sea spray or sulfuric acid that are floating in the atmosphere. So things that we can't see are quite hard to imagine, but with the development of microscopes, people are quite familiar with the bacteria that team around in drops of water and so on. But we don't think they have a really good idea of our microscopic world in the air around us. Can you give us a sense of what's suspended in the air we breathe and what it looks like? Yeah, I mean, actually, you have a good example of aerosols because once in a while, we still need to clean dust from surfaces. And that is actually the atmospheric particles that have settled down. So even though you don't see them, but you see them also when you have a beam or something like that, and you still look at a light, you do see them. So occasionally you can, can see them. Oh, you see, if you have a pollen outbreak, you can also see that visually. But the rest... To come back to your question of what is in the air, it's mainly the gases, oxy nitrogen, first of all, and oxygen, and argon, and then carbon dioxide. And then we have a variable fraction of water vapor that varies upon, depending on the location, say, between 0 and 4%. And then there is a load of aerosols. And that depends on the season and where you're on the location. So dust from the deserts or sea spray over the ocean, or when you have biomass burning or wildfires, then you have smoke up there and so on. Yeah. How big are these particles? Well, they range. They range over orders of magnitude. The largest are as thick as human hair, but they are much smaller. They go from 1.5 nanometers. So this is just one order of magnitude larger than an air molecule, for instance. So they are really tiny, but then they can be up to 10 micrometers or so, so rather large. Their properties really depend on that size. So some of them are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of times larger. How does that difference in size affect the way they behave and, and what their impacts are? Very much so. So the very smallest one, subject to what is called Brownian motion, so that air molecules hit on them and basically with that determine where they are going next. And so the very small ones, because of this Brownian motion from the air molecules hitting them, will cause them to coagulate, to become larger, to become larger particles. And then if they are larger particles, they can also be attracted by cloud droplets or so if they fall. Or if they are really large, then they're heavy enough that they fall according to their own weight. And that's what you see accumulating on table surfaces or something like that. So you have the different ones then. And then you have the ones in the middle range, what we call accumulation mode. And they are more or less, this is between, roughly speaking, 0.1 and 1 micron, which is the thousands of a millimeter. And that's exactly where the wavelength of visible light is, because visible light is between 400 and 700 nanometers or 0.4 to 0.7 micrometers. And so if you have aerosol particles of that size, they interact best with the solar radiation. 
So this is where they scatter the most radiation. And accumulation mode means they accumulate in the atmosphere. They are too large to be affected by this Brownian motion, and they are too small to settle according to their own weight. So that's why they accumulate. And you talk about them being effective at scattering light. Am I right that the smaller you make the particle, the same amount of stuff, if you have a ton of particles, the smaller you make them, the more light they'll reflect, the bigger their surface area. Yes, you're right. I mean, this is there's different scattering regimes as we speak. So the blue light is definitely blue because the air molecules scatter sunlight and blue is the shortest wavelength. And they scatter proportionally to the wavelengths to the power of four. So if they are at the smallest wavelength, they, they scatter much more. And so if the wavelengths become larger, so then if it goes over to red, for instance, at the if you have a sunset or a sunrise and you see the sky being red, this is because all other visible light is more or less scattered out of the path and what's left over is the red light. So there's definitely this wavelength dependency but then you have different scattering regimes. So what you just had, the scattering of air molecules per visible light, this is a different scattering regime from what we call me regimes, where aerosols are in. That wavelength dependence is much weaker. And that's predominantly then in the forward direction. And that basically scatters all visible light. So that's why if you have a lot of haze or lots of aerosols, then the sky appears whitish because you basically scatter all the different wavelengths. But yeah, I guess, so I guess my, my point was sort of the if you had a ton of stuff, ah, the ah, large okay. particles don't scatter much. But if you make them smaller and smaller and smaller, you get more and more and more of them. And they, they effectively can, they have a larger area to reflect. Yes, that's true. But they still need, if it's aerosols, so if we don't speak about clouds, if it's aerosols, they, you want them in the correct size range. Yeah. So if you make them smaller and smaller and smaller, then they don't interact as prominently with the solar radiation. When they get smaller than the wavelength of light. Visible light, yeah. yes. But yes. if they're sort of about that size, then yes. they're perfect yes. to reflect the light. If they are perfect, then yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, of course, the minute you increase the surface area, the more reflection you get. So the air we're breathing now, the sky is a little hazy today. How much stuff is suspended in the air we're breathing? And, and what does that mean for our health? Roughly speaking, you could say over the continents, you have around a thousand particles per tiny cubic centimeter, so quite a bit, or even more. For the health, the worst for your health are the smallest particles, because if they are the really smallest ones, and they can affect, they can, you can breathe them in, they can enter your lungs, and they can also go through the alveola and into your blood system, and they can cause all sorts of diseases because of that. If they are huge, like mineral dust or pollen or something like that, you would breathe them in, but you cough and it's immediately out. You, yeah. They basically don't penetrate so much. So for health, it's clearly that the smaller they are, the worse they are. And then, of course, if you have toxic substances on them, for instance, those PAHs or so, then, of course, you don't want to breathe them in at all. So the one aerosol species that really bad for your health is black carbon or soot, because this is small. And it can have toxic substances on it, and you definitely don't want to breathe it in. So riding a car behind a truck is definitely not healthy. Yeah, because we've got a lot of diesel engines in Europe, and that makes a lot of this city that's not good. Exactly. I mean, you could easily get rid of that because you have diesel filters, which are very powerful. So it's a very powerful way to reduce the soot emissions. But those are the things that you don't really want to breathe in. Another type of particle that we talk a lot about in solar engineering and when thinking about the climate is our sulfate particles. Can you explain what those are and what their impacts are? Yes, sulfate particles means that there is sulfur in them and there's different kinds. You have ammonium sulfate or you have sulfuric acid and then you can have ammonium bisulfate. So those are the three different forms that you can have. Sulfuric acid is liquid all the time. Ammonium sulfate can, depending on the relative humidity outside, be either solid or liquid. Why does it matter? It matters because if you want to form a liquid cloud, you want to have a liquid particle. If you want to form an ice cloud, then you want a solid particle for the water vapor to be deposited on, to be an ice crystal. So that's why it's important which phase they are in. In terms of reactivity, sulfuric acid, as the name says, is an acid that's aggressive. Ammonium sulfate is neutralized, so that is much less harmful. And for the stratospheric aerosol injection that you're basically alluding to when you say that sulfate particles in association with solar geoengineering, 
the size distribution is different because sulfuric acid particles come from gas phase precursors. So in the atmosphere, then you have sulfur dioxide and water vapor, and that basically oxidizes the SO2 to form the sulfuric acid. And that's still in a gas phase, and then it needs to nucleate, so overcoming an energy barrier to basically become a liquid particle. And then you have really the very smallest aerosol particles, because the very smallest particles between 1.5 and 5 nanometer in radius, that's what we call nucleation mode. This means they come from the gas phase. They're really small. Where do they come from? <laughs> Sulfur dioxide from volcanic eruptions, for instance. It comes also from the, in the ocean, you have some phytoplanktons. Then if that's eaten by zooplankton, it emits what's called demetyl sulfide. And this DMS then gets oxidized to get first the sulfur dioxide, SO2, and that then gets further oxidized to form sulfuric acid. So isn't one of the biggest sources a byproduct of burning fossil fuels? Yes, depending on what it is. You have coal, for instance. Brown coal is famous for its high sulfur content. This is also something you can also try to get rid of the aerosol emission or precursor emissions from the coal plants. So that's much easier to keep away than it is the CO2 emissions. I mean, CO2 is very hard to hold off at the source. Yeah, because I think in Europe and America, we've done a lot to clean the sulfur mm -hmm. out of our fossil fuel power plants exactly. and our ship emissions, whereas other parts of the world are still used quite dirty, quite a, emit quite a lot. Let's shift gears here a bit to the other main topic, and we'll bring them together here in a bit. We've talked about aerosols, and let's move on to clouds. So I think most people know that clouds consist of water, but can you be more specific? What are clouds? Is it all liquid? Is it sometimes solid? How big are the particles, and how does it relate to aerosols? Yes, so you're right. Clouds are water, either liquid water or ice, depending on the temperature. The interesting thing is that a cloud can even be liquid if it's at temperatures below zero degrees. So we can have something that's called supercooled cloud droplets. And that's just because the cloud droplets by themselves don't have the energy that's needed to freeze. They need help with freezing. And so, yes, you can have liquid clouds, you can have ice clouds, or you can have so-called mixed phase clouds, which have both cloud droplets and ice crystals. They also, because cloud droplets and also often ice crystals form on aerosol particles, there is a little bit of solute in them, as we would say. So there, it's not pure water, but there's so much water in that that you can consider them as being pure water droplets. So clouds are a type of aerosol. Yes, not really. So you would distinguish them. They can be of the same size. So I forgot to answer that question. A typical dro cloud droplet is maybe 10 micrometer in diameter. So that's like your hair. The difference is the water droplet is so diluted that it pretty much can consider as a pure water, whereas an aerosol is highly concentrated and you have much more okay. salt in it. Okay, so there are also small particles, but they're slightly larger and they're pure enough water that scientists generally don't call them aerosols per se. Yeah, and plus it's much more localized. I mean, you sometimes, yes, one can speak of an aerosol cloud, like if you have a pollen outbreak or so, then you would say this is an aerosol cloud. But typically the definition of a cloud is that it's an isolated entity and somewhere else it's cloud free, whereas aerosols have a much more continuous spectrum as well. But you're right, if they have the same size and they are next to each other, then you would categorize them according of how much substance is in there. And only if they are dilute enough, then you would call them cloud droplet at that size. And if they are very rich in salt or acid, then it's still errors. And why do clouds hang together? Why doesn't the cloud, why don't all clouds disperse and just become water droplets that are homogeneously distributed through the atmosphere? That also happens, but then you don't see them anymore. Because the definition of a cloud <laughs> is that it's a visible object against the blue sky. So if you have too few of them, then you actually don't see that. There's something that's called clear sky precipitation. If you are in the mountains and you have a really clear and cold day, you sometimes see individual ice crystals falling down, but you don't see them visually as a cloud. And that's because there are very much too few of them. Back to the question, why do they hang together, is because the formation is very different. For every cloud to form, air has to rise. And air that's rising is expanding and by expansion cooling. And at one point, the water vapor content in the air parcel or air mass cannot be kept in the vapor phase and needs to condense. And that's what you see. You basically, whenever you see a cloud, 
that's your indication of that there's air rising. So clouds also move. Are all the water droplets moving together or to what extent is this the creation of new water droplets and clouds on one side and the dissolution on the back side? That depends on the cloud type. So if you have like really big storms, severe convective storms like multi-cells or so, then you really have multi-cells because at one side of them, the new cell is forming and then the other side, the old cells are dying. Then you see them actually at different right. stages of formation. If you think of this typical fair weather cumulus cloud that forms on a nice summer day in the clear sky, then it's basically moving up and the new cloud droplets that are formed are always formed at cloud base and then they are lifted further up. And at one point, if they are collided and become large enough, then they can come down as precipitation again. How do clouds relate to aerosol emissions? Is there a relationship between, for example, the sulfur dioxide or the, or the black carbon or other anthropogenic human-caused emissions in clouds? Yes, all cloud droplets actually that we have in the atmosphere form on aerosol particles, and they do form on liquid aerosol particles, just because you want a substance that loves water. So if you had a soot surface or something like that, and that's repelling water, the water wouldn't go on it, right? Having said that, if you have a real clear place in the atmosphere where you don't have any aerosols, you wouldn't, under the natural conditions or the normal conditions that we have in the atmosphere, you wouldn't even be able to form a cloud. Because for water vapor, without the help of an aerosol to condense to form a cloud droplet, you would need to have a relative humidity of 400 to 700%. And we just don't have that. We have 100% or maybe 101% and then we see the cloud forming. And this means that whenever we have a cloud, we also have an abundance of those aerosol particles. We have enough of them that cloud droplets can just form. Is this analogous to the sort of home science experiment that I did with my son, for example, a few years ago, where you can create a, a solution of water that's super saturated with sugar or something, but no crystals form until a seed crystal is dropped in and then it grabs onto this nucleus. Is that sort of the same thing that's going on, but instead of water and dissolved sugar, it's air and water vapor. Exactly. That's exactly how it is. It is super, It needs supersaturation. That's exactly what is right. You need the supersaturation. And then if you have a soluble particle, then you actually make it much easier for the water vapor to condense onto. Am I right that it's the surface tension of the water that resists the formation of those, those very tiniest droplets? Yes and no, but easily speaking, it is because it, you need work, you need energy to create a new surface. So it's the energy needed to form the surface. And then in that energy term, there is the surface tension as such is included in there. Yes. It's sort of this elastic force that yes. kind of squeeze the water out of the very tiny droplets. Exactly. Back to the cloud condensation nuclei, those are the aerosols, which can be solid or liquid, that the water vapor is able to grab onto and form water droplets that in turn form clouds. We do see more and different types of clouds above human sources of aerosols, such as cities and ships that travel across the ocean and they leave a... Am I right there? And what happens? Yes, you're right. You're right in that the amount of water vapor that condenses is the same. So if you have similar starting conditions, temperature, given humidity, and you let different air passes rise, one over a polluted, one over a clean, then you would have the same two different clouds forming the same water content in both of them. What's different is how many particles, how many cloud droplets are in each of them. So when the air parcel rises over a pollution area, over a city, then you have many more aerosols. So the water vapor has many more cloud condensation nuclei, as you said, where it can condense onto. So the cloud droplets compete for the available water vapor and they just don't grow as large. And now back to what we had discussed before, now the cross-sectional area or the total surface area comes into play. Because the cloud that forms over a polluted place consists of many more and smaller cloud droplets, has a much larger surface area, and reflects much more shortwave radiation, solar radiation, than the clean clouds that would form for similar conditions, but on much fewer cloud condensation nuclei. That makes sense. And I know it's complicated, but what's the relationship between clouds and climate change? 
how is climate change changing clouds and how do clouds impact global warming? Actually, clouds do both things. They cool the climate and they warm the climate. And that depends for one, if it's night or day. That's for us the easiest example to envision because we know that if you have a summer day, you have a cloud there, it's much colder underneath than if it's cloud free. At night, it's generally the opposite. Whenever you have a clear night, it gets much colder in the morning because all the radiation from the Earth can escape to space. Whereas if you have clouds, you have some radiation from the Earth being absorbed and re-emitted back to the Earth, and we know it's warmer. So we have clouds that warm, and we have clouds that cool. And if you look at the different cloud types, then all the low clouds, where we have low clouds, so say a kilometer, give or take, above the surface, they have lots of water vapor. Just because temperature is decreasing in the troposphere with altitude, and the colder it gets, the less water vapor mass can contain. So the lower down the cloud, the more water vapor is available that can condense. And that's why the cloud is much thicker optically. That's why it's much grayer. If you are beneath a low-level cloud, it's gray. If you have a cirrus cloud on top, it's milky, the sky, but it's still bright. And so the thicker the cloud, and during the day, the thicker the cloud, the more solar radiation it reflects. So the best reflectors of sunlight are low-level clouds. And especially so if they form over a dark surface, like over the ocean. So low-level clouds over the ocean, they cool the climate the most. And in the current day climate, clouds actually cool. They help us, otherwise it would be much warmer. Cirrus clouds that form in the altitudes where also the airplanes fly, they behave like greenhouse gases. They are so thin, they're also called semi-transparent, so most of the sunlight gets through. That's why it's just a milky sky, but it's still bright. But they absorb part of the radiation that's emitted from the Earth or the atmosphere underneath them, absorbs it and re-emits at their own cold temperatures. And that's much less infrared or terrestrial radiation that's then emitted to space. So they really warm. And now your question is, what happens with climate change? And with climate change, clouds contribute actually to making it warmer because both cloud types don't behave in our favor. We tend to get more high-level clouds, so we get more of those warming clouds, and they actually go, relatively speaking, to higher altitudes. So then the temperature difference to the Earth, temperature of the Earth, and where they are becomes larger, so they warm more. And the stratus clouds over the ocean that reflect most sunlight tend to break up because it's getting warmer, Breaking up means that it becomes more convective. You get to more isolated, scattered clouds that reflect overall less radiation than if you had a solid extended cloud deck. Fewer of the cooling clouds and more of the warming clouds with climate change. So there's a slight positive feedback yes. cycle. Positive, not in the sense of desirable, but global warming causes the clouds to change in a way that causes more global warming. Exactly. Some clouds have a net cooling effect. Some clouds have a net warming effect. And related to that, clouds have been the proposed medium through which two different proposed methods of climate intervention or geoengineering have been proposed. So there's marine cloud brightening and cirrus cloud thinning. Could you give a very brief introduction to these two proposed means to help cool the planet and counter global warming? Yes, exactly. Because I said, like, the stratus clouds, the low-lying clouds over the ocean cause the most cooling of the Earth's atmosphere system in the current climate. So making more of those clouds or causing th those clouds to be brighter would give you an additional cooling. So the idea is either you, so with sea spray, you could basically cause the cloud droplets to form on many more particles. So then you have this higher cross-sectional area and you reflect more sunlight. or you could even try to get clouds to form in areas over the ocean that are still cloud-free currently. So basically, you want to increase the reflectivity or the amount of those clouds that cool. That's marine cloud brightening. On the other hand, cirrus cloud thinning is trying to get rid of all of those cirrus clouds that warm the climate. And then you can estimate how much of a global effect that has in the current climate. And that's approximately two watts per meter square. So that's half of the CO2 doubling. So if you got rid of that, in principle, half of the CO2 doubling could be counteracted by cirrus cloud thinning. 
So that could be up to a degree, degree and a half in that neighborhood. Exactly. Okay, and this would dissipate those highest level clouds, the feathery cirrus clouds that we can sometimes see as little wisps high in the sky. Yes, exactly. Okay, great. So you've been working on a project called Cloud Lab, which I believe aims to better understand some wintertime clones of the Alps. Can you tell us a little about this project? What are the clouds you're looking at and what are you hoping to understand about them? Yes, of course. I'm happy to discuss our pet project. Yes, we are looking like Switzerland has one of the most boring cloud types, persistent low-level clouds, like you have over the ocean. We also get that in Switzerland in winter. If we have a high pressure system over Europe and we get cold air, and then we have like Switzerland is between the Jurassic Mountains and the Alps. And so the cold air gets channeled under it or between it and has moisture sources. We have enough lakes, so enough moisture, cold air, and we create clouds. And those clouds are really persistent there. They really stay. It's the same kind of person. I lived in Berlin. I lived in Northern Europe a lot. The persistent wintertime clouds that we often get that make it very miserable. Are these it's the same kind of clouds? Exactly. Yeah. It's the one that makes it really miserable because it's gray underneath. If you are on top, then it's great. Then from the mountains, it looks great. Then you look at the clouds, white clouds below you. And it's actually this high pressure system from above leads to this temperature inversion that you need to basically trap the moisture underneath. And so we thought we take this cloud type because this is stationary, it's rather persistent. And that means also that experiments that we do can be reproducible. So it's not like one cloud is very different from the next, but we have a rather stable situation. And what we are interested to understand is how easy is it to transform a cloud that's at temperatures below zero and is still liquid, how easily can we convert that into a cloud that has ice crystals in them? So how easily can we form ice crystals and will they fall out? Will we actually see that the cloud is dissolving or what is going on there? So we are basically really aiming at understanding the fundamental physics of it. So you were talking earlier about air being super saturated water and it not quite being able to form unless it's a little seed. Is this a similar thing that you're just below freezing, but you still got water droplets that want to become ice, but can't? It's exactly this. Below zero degrees, everything wants to be ice. That's true. And you see that if you have a large area, like if you are on the road, of course, then you need only a small puddle which is still huge compared to a cloud droplet. And there's so much dirt on the road that it freezes immediately. So on the road, you would always find ice exactly below zero. But in the cloud, you need to have a seat within every cloud droplet. And it's the same energy barrier that needs to be overcome because you need the liquid H2O molecules to rearrange and form this ice lattice. And forming this ice lattice again, requires energy because you're creating a new surface. So it's the same process. And the colder it gets, the smaller and smaller is this energy barrier. So at one point, if you're at temperatures below minus 38 degrees centigrade, then that freezing process can happen spontaneously. Because at that point, the water really desperately wants to be in the ice phase and it can happen. But before that point, you need one of these little ice nuclei, these little seeds. So what happens if the cloud transitions from having these super cool droplets to ice crystals? Yeah, so what happens is if you add some ice nucleating particles, be it mineral dust, for instance, which would do that naturally, or if you have silver iodide, which is used for cloud seeding, then you do have the seed particle and then you form the first ice crystal. And then the way it is with the supersaturation is that from that moment on, the air is supersaturated with respect to the ice crystals. That's the preferred phase. And all the water vapor now goes onto the ice crystals. But the atmosphere becomes subsaturated with respect to liquid water. So then the cloud droplets evaporate. So you basically have the growth of the ice crystals at the expense of the cloud droplets. So that's why you see such so-called hole punch cloud, where you have this super cooled liquid cloud layer, and there is a hole. And in the hole, it's basically you have ice crystals that formed and they grow large enough at the expense of those evaporating cloud droplets that the ice crystals fall out and that creates the hole in the cloud. 
yeah, you had a slide earlier. I'm trying to describe it. There was a sort of this thin cloud layer, and then this kind of slightly odd-looking, kind of sucked out dark area where something had interrupted that cloud. It looks like a vacuum cleaner from below, sucking the ice crystals out there. Something like that, exactly. And that can happen. So the whole punch cloud, there's normally an aircraft because you have so much turbulence behind the aircraft wings that you decrease the temperature by 10 to 15 degrees. So if you have a cool cloud, say, at minus 20, minus 25, this additional cooling could be enough to create homogeneous nucleation so that the... Start as ice crystals. Yeah, that the ice crystals go spontaneously and fall out. So with this project, you're sort of picking up where, I guess, cloud seeding left off. What is cloud seeding? Does it work? Yes. So cloud seeding is exactly that. You have your super cool cloud and cloud seeding has been established because people are not happy with a super cool cloud. They would either want to exploit it to produce precipitation. So that would be one aspect of why you want to seed that and convert this non-precipitating super cool liquid cloud into a precipitating ice cloud. Or it could be if it's fog, for instance, at an airport and you can't fly, then of course you want to dissolve the fog. That's another application. And cloud seeding with the same technology with a little different focus is also used for hail prevention, trying to create many more small hailstones instead of the larger ones. Those are the three applications of cloud seeding. See, this is an area where my feeling perhaps was that there was quite a lot of boasting and promises and not enough evidence. Are we now at a stage where we can say that these different types of cloud seeding do really work? It works on a very small scale, yes. So we have seen that. We have seen that from one field experiments in the United States. We have seen it in our field experiments. If we have this super cool liquid cloud and we put ice nucleating particles into it, then we actually can cause glaciation, so freezing over of the cloud and it falls out. So this works. If it's enough to produce substantial amounts of snow, I don't think so. If it's enough to burn off a cloud or fog if you are over an airport, yes. If you're doing it to prevent hail, the jury is still out. I don't think it works there. So mixed results. So you're using the same technology, the same silver iodide flares, am I right? And this, yes. can, you, can you describe the experiment that you were conducting? Yes. So we have a drone. We have drones that are commercially used in Switzerland to profile the atmosphere. So they are equipped with a heating system so that they don't ice over when they fly through the cloud. And that, so we have flares where we have silver iodide in them. So if they are burned off, they burn for five to six minutes. And we do a zigzagging flight pattern, release those particles, and we know the wind direction. And so we have our measurement devices downwind of where we inject those silver iodide particles. And we can vary the distance to our main measurement site. And then we have different growth times. And then we can infer or learn from that the ice crystal growth. And you've already done these experiments. Yes, we have done these experiments last winter. And we have seen that it really works as we anticipated. Then if we vary the growth time, we actually also see the larger and larger ice crystals forming. And we could also, in the remote sensing data and the radar images, we could clearly see that the crystals fall then all the way to the surface of the ice crystals. What's the value of these experiments for our understanding of these clouds and their processes? Like, what do you get from doing a field test that you couldn't get from observations or, or modeling? For instance, if you look at the whole punch clouds from the aircraft, you have a harder time of knowing what temperature is the cloud really at before, because you only see it visually in the satellite images or cloud cameras, sky cameras, that there is the whole, but you don't know exactly the conditions. We know because we have all the in measurement devices, in situ measurement devices, we know exactly the temperature of the cloud. We have our instrument, the holographic instrument, which gives us images of the cloud particles. So we really know that before we seed it, it was only cloud droplets. And after we seed it, we saw its ice crystals and we saw their shape. So that also confirms at which temperature conditions they have grown. So we basically, you could say, all we have done is verified what we thought happens in theory. So it's a good confirmation of that this process of icing over operates the same way in the field as we think and under the controlled conditions that we do have. And I guess it gives you something for your models to reproduce or fail to reproduce. Exactly, because in the models, often you base the way processes in clouds work in models, you base it on laboratory studies. And laboratory study is very nice because you have real reproducible conditions. 
But most of the time you don't have turbulence and you don't really know what are the mixing of cloudy air with cloud free air, how this is going to influence the results and all that. So between idealized laboratory studies and doing, say, if it relates to solar geoengineering or other types of climate intervention methods, you have to have field tests. And if you have field tests in very variable conditions, you never know what the reference cloud would have done. So you do need, and this is the beauty of it or the uniqueness of it, that we have the reference condition and we can perturb that and still know this is really different from the background because it's there. So it sounds like this work is valuable from the point of view of understanding cloud processes and developing our understanding there. But there's also a, a kind of a dual purpose or another meaning of these results in these experiments, which is that there's a, a new idea for solar geoengineering that's sort of inspired by these mixed-based clouds. Can you explain that? Yes, because if this process that we have shown that works on the small scale, that we can convert a non-precipitating cloud to precipitate locally, we could think of where in the, on the climate system, where on the earth do we have clouds that actually are super cooled and then warm the atmosphere. So if we were to get rid of those warming super cooled clouds, we would have a means as a radiation management to basically contribute to a cooling. And so we have done that by using a global climate model. And then we have first of all looked at where is the potential for those clouds to warm. And this is basically in polar winter. And it's in polar winter because in polar winter you don't have any sunlight, so you don't reflect any sunlight from those clouds. And all what you have left is that they absorb the radiation emitted from Earth and re-emit it. So this are then, then you have basically greenhouse gases. Then they behave like greenhouse gases. And the way to get rid of them is, is exactly the method that we have discussed. So you put some suitable seeds into them, cause them to precipitate and be gone. And then you will cool the climate. Yeah, so these clouds are naturally insulating, and if you, but they're vulnerable or they're susceptible to being suppressed, to being pulled down by adding these ice with the so was your experiment a field test of geoengineering or was it a field experiment to understand cloud physics or is it a bit of both? Okay, and what are the implications of those two different interpretations? We actually called it cloud lab because we kind of bit the idea that we basically do the laboratory in the field or use the natural cloud as a laboratory, which wherever you want. And we basically said we are using a weather modification method because that works. But our interest was really to understand fundamental cloud physics. So coincidentally, at the same time, somebody working in my group came up with the idea to exploit this for geoengineering purposes. And of course, I mean, the knowledge of how you convert a non-precipitating cloud into a precipitating cloud is out there. It makes sense to take those results and also use them for climate engineering purposes or see what the potential of this method is for climate engineering purposes. So you did your test with relatively low clouds, as I understand it, in Switzerland, which is sort of a, at a mid-latitude location. But the application of this, if it were to be used to slightly counteract global warming, would be at high altitudes, at high latitudes, that is near the poles, during their winter. So this reminds me, of course, of cirrus cloud thinning. So there's something in common in that they would both be proposals to dissipate heat trapping clouds, but they're different methods. So could you contrast what you've been researching with what others have been talking about and calling cirrus cloud thinning? Yes, of course. So you're right. We would look for this mixed phase cloud thinning in polar latitudes. It would be around mid-levels, depending on the temperature, it could also be lower ones. It just depends on the temperature. If it's close to minus five near the surface, then you don't need to go high as long as they warm. Cirrus clouds is also because I said before they warm the Earth's atmosphere system, so you want to get rid of them. The difference there is, is much harder. You can't inject ice nucleating particle in an existing cirrus cloud. I mean, you could, but it would be much more beneficial if in the process that the cirrus cloud is forming, at that point, there were those ice nucleating particles because then the water vapor would grab onto them and you would form fewer crystals that grow much larger and they sediment. And you don't even form this cirrus cloud that's not sedimenting by its own means. So for cirrus cloud thinning, you should or you need to anticipate when the cloud is going to form 
on those many small sulfuric acid particles and basically they freeze. Then they have liquid sulfuric acid and that freezes. And you want to be before this freezing process happens. And to anticipate that is really difficult because if you do it wrongly, you produce cirrus clouds where otherwise none of them would have formed. And that's why this cirrus cloud thinning has the negative side effect that you could be creating more cirrus clouds. Right. It's quite the opposite of what you really want. So cirrus cloud thinning isn't thinning per se. It's not dissipation. It's, in a way, it's prevention. It's prevention, exactly. So in a way, what we have tried as a community or where some research has been done in, where can you fly or where aircraft can fly to avoid forming contrails? This is the only thing where we can learn something from it, but you kind of want to prevent a cloud from forming, which is much more difficult than if you have an existing super cool liquid cloud and you see the cloud visually, then just cause it to go away. Reminds me a little of the book, A Scanner Darkly, where they can predict the future and tackle pre-crime. Here you're tackling pre-clouds. Exactly. That would be the aim. That would be the ante anticipation. And yeah. That's why I think this it's much more challenging and much more demanding. And I, I'm not sure that it would work because those particles, if you inject them up there, they take much longer to disappear. So they are there. So even if you may be able to prevent one cirrus cloud and the particles are still around there, maybe then somewhere else forms a cirrus cloud where none would have formed. I so guess coming back to Cloud Lab and these mixed base clouds in your valley in Switzerland, could you take the approach that you use for this experiment and scale it up? and diminish these clouds in, in that region. What's the, what are the practicalities of trying to actually do this in, at a larger scale? This is exactly one of the interesting questions. What is the potential of scaling that up from our lo local scale all to a regional scale that you would need it for climate engineering? And the honest answer is, I don't know. I have no clue what payload we would need and how often we would need to see it, but for sure it's going to be expensive. Because, I mean, we, with this just drone, we, we burn a tiny hole in the cloud. And now you don't want a tiny hole, but you want to get rid of all the clouds, mixed phase clouds over the Arctic Ocean. That's a much larger area. So I, I don't know how expensive it would be, how much material we would need. And if the, how often the deployment would need to be taking place. Can it be done by drones only, whatever is needed? I really don't know. Sorry. And the material that is used for cloud seeding the silver iodide, right? Is that what you use? Yes. For our localized experiments in Switzerland, we use silver iodide. And we use silver iodide because it has the beauty for our applications that it starts to cause ice crystal formation at temperatures below minus 5 degrees centigrade. So at rather warm sub-zero temperatures. If you were to do it for climate engineering purposes, I think the better material would be some sort of mineral dust because all the desert dust that we have is also causing clouds to freeze naturally. And that material is much cheaper, much more abundant, and has no negative side effects because silver iodide is toxic in large concentrations. So we don't want that. For our small experiments, this is still less than what's around in natural soil processes. That's negligible. But I don't think you want to scale that up. Well, we usually like to end on a positive note. How optimistic about the future of our fight against climate change are you? And what gives you optimism about that? What gives me optimism is that solar panels, solar power, UPV, has been increasing exponentially. So I think once the value is seen in the market that there is something that is doable, we as human beings are enough of engineers and smart enough to make it cheaper and cheaper and you know, smarter and smarter that at one point it's not as expensive as we thought it would be. So we can do that with renewable energies. And I'm sure we will also find a way to withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere, which is urgently needed. And so I think if we take both of that together, what we have seen in terms of photovoltaic and in our ability now to take CO2 out of the atmosphere, I think we can get to net zero. The question is when. On that note, let's bring it to a close. Thank you very much, Erika. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere. And consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challengingclimate.